I'm, I'm fine. I'm just not seeing uh, any more the room, so I don't know if the people are in the room or not. No, I think, uh, yes. They are in the room. Ah, and thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Sir. We start again. I, uh, I couldn't see the room anymore, so I didn't know if the people were seated or not, and uh, I didn't know what was the situation where we were. Very good. So we can start back. Oop. And okay, so up to now, I've been talking to you about how to relate, how to relate the, uh, how to relate the, the existence of the transition to the existence. So the existence of the ferromagnetic transition of an Ising model into the existence of a condensation transition in a Bose gas with uh, non-standard, non-analytic uh, kinetic energy. Now, interestingly, we cannot only relate the existence of the, so basically we say that, that we can do the mapping between the spin and the boson, so we can diagonalize the boson, then we can take the continuum limit, uh, and from the continuum limit, we get that the, uh, that the transition always exists as long as this condition is fulfilled. Now, we can do something more. We can also try to study the properties of the transition of the quantum critical point in terms of the bosons. So, and the, the, the features of the quantum critical point that I'm interested in are critical exponents. Now, I don't know how many of you know about critical exponents in quantum phase transition. I, for the moment, I'm trying to give you some definitions and I ask you to make, to stop me and make any questions if you have some doubt over these definitions. The definitions are quite simple and kind of intuitive, but uh, but if you don't have much experience, I, some verifications may be needed. So we say that the, the Ising model can be related to this Bose gas with this dispersion relation. Now, in order for the phase transition to occur, we need the gas to be, uh, so we need the, the chemical potential of the gas to attain a certain value, you know, because in here you see this was the form of the, uh, which was the form of the dispersion relation of the lattice. And a quantum phase transition occurs when the mode becomes soft. It means when this omega becomes basically zero, okay? But in order for this omega to become zero, it means that H has to become equal to VK equal to zero. No, you see. So basically, we, at, a at a quantum critical point, this omega has to vanish. And this vanishing omega is related to H going close to the value of V0, of the V of zero momentum. And the V of zero momentum, uh, well, you can compute it from here. The V of zero momentum, you can compute it from here. And it's nothing but the uh, Riemann zeta function, or if you include the cast normalization, it's, not, it's just one. So we can say that as H approaches the critical value, which is one, so this omega becomes zero. And now the critical exponents are defined by the scaling of the omega close to zero. So this is the definition of the gap exponent. The gap exponent is called the Z nu. And it is defined as the way in which the zero momentum gap, the zero momentum frequency, vanishes as a function of h approaching the critical value. And it's obvious from this computation 
that in our approximation, this value is one half. Because V of K equal to zero is one. And this goes to, and omega of K equal to zero goes to zero, like the square root of H minus one. And so this Z nu is one half because there was a square root. Another critical exponent is the dynamical exponent Z. And the dynamical exponent Z is deduced by how the frequency or the energy spectrum scales at the critical point as a function of the momentum. So what is the power of K with which this omega scales when H is equal to H critical? So once again, it's easy to do this in our approximation because we can just take H equal to H critical and we just need to uh, take the expansion of VK as a function of K. The expansion of VK is K to the sigma. But if H is at the critical point, we have the square root, the square root of K sigma. And so it means that this Z is sigma over two. So Z nu is one half and Z is sigma over two. And then we can use these two values to also compute nu, which is the divergence of the correlation length. But I don't want to define the correlation length in this moment. So let's just focus on these two definitions. Very good. So these are the definitions of the critical exponent. And what, what I have just said, according to this definition, in our approximation, we have the following values. Z nu is equal to one alpha, I've already told you. And Z is equal to sigma alpha. And this is obviously valid as long as sigma is less or equal than two. When sigma is larger than two, this Z is simply one, because as you know, also as I already told you, when sigma is larger than two, this guy, the K to the square wins, and the lower energy theory is a standard Bose gas. Okay, so thanks to the mapping from of the spin to the bosons, we were able, first of all, to understand the possibility to have a transition. The, the yes, the, to understand the, the condition for having a transition. But we were also able to compute some critical exponents, which are approximated, but gives us a rough idea of what's going on in the system. Anyway, this is not the only approximation I can think of, we can think of. We can also think about an approximation in which the, the spins of the original model are not mapped into bosons, but are mapped into fermions. This approximation is quite more complicated. I don't want to give you too many details about that because it will bring it will bring us too far outside. I just want you to know that it exists. It exists as such an approximation that maps the spins of the system into fermions. And what is most interesting of this approximation is that this approximation is not approx an approximation at all if the system is nearest neighbor. If the, nearest, if the system is nearest neighbor, this transformation that's called jordan Wigner is not an approximation, but it's exact. So up to now, I have been showing you the study of the Ising model in terms of bosons. But I could also study the Ising model in terms of fermionic excitation, so the C and C dagger. The definition of this fermionic excitation is quite complicated, but it, the intuitive picture is very simple. These fermionic excitations are domain wall. No, are basically, if you start from a fully paramagnetic state, so a state which is fully aligned with the magnetic field, the, this, the domain walls are just kink in, the, in this magnetization that occur at certain sites. And these are completely opposite to the spin waves, because if you remember the spin waves that I've defined before, they were completely non-local 
objects. No? These were spin waves which have low momenta, they were fully non local objects. But these guys here are very local things, so they are just spin, they are magnetization flips. Okay, so I can make, I can map my icing model into a gas of kink. And this gas of kink, it's uh, also solvable analytically because it's basically has the same property of the bosonic system. It's just a system of fermions hopping on the lattice with some, non, with some anomalous pairing term. So also in this case, we have some term which does not conserve the number of particles. So it's a bit odd. But you see the Hamiltonian, it's, it resembles very closely the one of the fermions, basically of the bosons. It basically, it's the same Hamiltonian. It's just the nature of the particles that has been changed. And the solution is also comes in the same way. It also comes by a Bogolubov transformation, but by a Bogolubov transformation with fermions, that it's also possible. It's still a two by two matrix. It is a it's still a rotation in SG1 space. And when you do this transformation, you find new quasi particles, which are BCS, so are the same quasi particle that you know from superconductive theory, if you have done superconductive theory. If you don't have, if you haven't done it, it's just the, sa the same procedure as before with some minus sign <laughs> in the sense with some different, uh, with some different definition that it's owed to the fact that these particles are fermions. And when I diagonalize it, the theory in terms of fermionic quasi particles, I get a different dispersion relation. Okay. A different dispersion relation, and this different dispersion relation is due to the fact that these are fermions. And now I don't only have the term H minus V as in the bosons, but I only have a new term, which is this delta, which is the Fourier transform of the interaction, but made with the sine instead of the cosine. So you remember with the boson, you, we had the cosine. Where was it? With bosons, we had the cosine. And now with fermions, we have both the cosine in this epsilon and the sine in delta. Okay, but apart from that, it's pretty standard. It's just the same procedure as before. But now I can compute again the critical exponents and these are different critical exponents. And you can try to do this yourself. Take this, this definition, take this uh, equation and reapply the same definition that I've given to you before. So reapply the same definitions. And when you do this procedure, you find different critical exponents from the bosonic theory with one crucial difference that these critical exponents are now exact when sigma is very large. So for when sigma is larger than one, when, sorry, when sigma is much larger than two, we have uh, that these critical exponents become exact because they are the correct critical exponent in the sigma infinity limit in the case of nearest neighbor interactions. And so we get to our final picture. This model, it can be mapped into bosons, which is the spin wave theory. And when it's mapped into bosons, it basically tells you two information. The first information is that there is a threshold value a sigma equal to two, above which the model looks like a nearest neighbor model looks like a local gas with k square kinetic term. It gives you also a second information that I didn't have time to talk to you about too much, but it is obtained by uh, a simple ginsburg landau argument. And this could be an exercise for you. Just take 
the bosonic theory that I showed you here and do a Ginsburg-Landau analysis to show that this theory also applies to the interacting case as long as a certain condition D over sigma is to be satisfied. And if you find, do this analysis, you will find that the bosonic theory becomes exact when sigma is below two thirds. Obviously, I'm talking about one dimension because I started talking about one dimension. So dimension is one in this slide. And so you see immediately what's the situation. From the bosonic theory, from the spin wave theory, we have some critical exponents which should be exact in the regime sigma going from zero to two thirds. And I encourage you to verify it doing a Ginsburg-Landau argument in this region. For sigma between two thirds and two, we have certain critical exponent coming from the bosonic theory, but the Ginsburg-Landau argument tells us that this cannot be correct or may not be correct. And for sigma larger than two, we have that the bosonic theory is not useful anymore. Because for sigma larger than two, the bosons will not condensate. So in this regime, the bosonic theory will tell you that there is no transition, but we actually know that there is a transition and we know that from the fermionic theory. So the fermionic theory, this is why this short range here is green, no? is because the fermionic theory predicts a transition for large sigma. And we know that this treatment is exact for large sigma. However, at small sigma, when sigma between, between, becomes small between two and one, we don't know, actually, we know that we cannot trust the fermionic theory. And the reason why we cannot trust the fermionic theory is that the, the transformation that I have been doing here, it, it's not quadratic anymore. So I have strong corrections. I didn't have time to talk about this, but I wanted you to at least get a glimpse of all that we can do with this long range rising model with sigma larger than zero. And the glimpse is, as I said, that the bosonic theory is good as small sigma, the fermionic theory is good at large sigma. They are both approximation at intermediate sigma. So in between, this, both this theory cannot give you the final answer. The final answer, it should be that the exact theory is mean field. That means it can be described by the bosonic theory between zero and this value for sigma in this range. And then in this range, the theory becomes non-mean field and it cannot be described neither in terms of boson, neither in terms of fermions. And then there is a threshold value, which I call sigma star, because I don't know which is this value. It's not one and it's not two. The bosons say that the threshold value is two. The fermions say that the threshold value is one, but actually in the exact theory, which I cannot study, I can only guess that this sigma star is between two and one. It's some number in between these two. In this, at, at this sigma star, the system, the long range interactions are not relevant anymore, are not important anymore at the transition. And the model becomes back nearest. It has the same critical exponents as the nearest neighbor model. So basically, this is the message I wanted to give you in this lecture. We can study the long range interacting IC model, not just for alpha smaller than D as I've done yesterday, but for alpha larger than D. And in that case, everything turns out to depend on sigma, which is alpha minus D or in one dimension, it's alpha minus one. And as a function of sigma, we have very different regimes and in each of these regions, in the, in the boundary regimes, we have two descriptions which are both exact for the critical exponents. One is the spin weight theory as small sigma, which gives exact critical exponents in here. 
One is the fermionic theory, which gives exact critical exponents a large sigma. But then we have an intermediate range where the, where the system it cannot be described either in terms of bosonic quasiparticles or in terms of fermionic quasiparticles. And in this middle regime, it's a very strongly interacting regime and it needs to be treated with more advanced field theoretical arguments. And this, I think, is too advanced for you. I will have some slides, but I don't want to talk to you about that. I want you just to remember this crucial point. As a function of sigma, there are regimes where the quasiparticles are fermions, regimes where the quasiparticles are bosons, and in the middle, there is a regime which is strongly interacting, and we don't know how to solve exactly. OK. I think I, I have given you enough information for this lecture. Please make me some questions. <coughs> so, Nicolas, I would like to remind that I showed uh, a slide in my lectures where uh, this uh, sort of uh, theory was uh, sketched, and I, I promised that uh, Nicolò would have talked about theory of uh, a regime uh, for uh, 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 sigma positive uh, where the mean field exponents uh, are still uh, valid, then an intermediate regime where we don't know much, and then a uh, uh, um, regime for sigma large in which you go, you go to, the, to, the, to the short range. Uh, limit, okay? So this is exactly the type of analysis that, uh, that you can do to, to make it more rigorous, OK? OK. Uh, and you saw also this, uh, this line, d over 2. Uh, uh, Nicolò, you are still there? Yeah, yeah I'm still here. OK, so may maybe you can make a comment on this uh, uh, d, uh, d over 2, sigma d over 2. Ah, sigma. Sigma d over 2, so 1 alpha. Yes. Uh, in one sigma, dimension. Sorry. So sigma, sigma equal 1 alpha for, from, from the point so, of view of the theory that I have. Uh, so you get two thirds in your theory. You, do, you don't get. Ah, uh, because, uh, sorry, just sorry. Uh, because this is the quantum. Yes, obviously. OK, now, yes. now, now I got what you meant. Uh, so basically. So I think Stefano showed you some plot which looks like this, basically. So there is the dimension on one axis and the sigma or the alpha in some other axis. And you see that there is a mean field region above a certain value. And then there is a strongly interacting region, which is the one I was talking about. And then there is a short range behavior for large sigma. This is exactly the same kind of feature that justifies this. This is just the one dimensional case. So this is just a cut of this picture in one dimension, or even here. Now, uh, for the, what is the difference between the quantum and the classical case? Well, this is a little bit maybe uh, complicated, but you see, there is a, a zoology of different mappings that you can do, no? And yesterday I told you that you can use structure decomposition to map a long range model, a quantum model, sorry, into a classical model. And yesterday we have done that for the fully connected case, but there is no reason to, to not do it also for, this, for the long range interactions, which are a little bit weaker, which are power law. And when you do this structure decomposition, you see that the quantum model is equivalent to a classical model, which is anisotropic, so which has an additional dimension, which is the time dimension, but that is, a that is anisotropic. And so the quantum model somehow is equivalent to a classical model, and you see this is this, this little part here, it's equivalent to a classical model, but in a dimension which is much larger. 
and uh, and basically you see i told you that the long range quantum model can be mapped onto a short range model in this effective dimension so i told you that the long range model can be related to the short range model in this effective dimension but it can also be related to a classical short range model and if we relate it to the classical short range model the effective dimension is not only 2d over sigma but it's 2d over sigma plus one that is telling you that the quantum mo so in order to reduce the long range interaction to the nearest neighbor interaction you have to use an effective fractional dimension so you have to say that d is equal to 2d over sigma but if you want to also map the quantum model into the classical one we have you have to also add an additional plus one so you see there is a a zoology of transformation that allows you to understand how the critical behavior prolongs from quantum long range to quantum short range to classical short range and if you put all of this together you will see that uh, if you redo the same argument in the class in the purely classical case where there is no quantum nature in absence of any quantum nature this plus one will not be there so this plus one is only due to quantum fluctuations in the system if you redo the same argument i have done in the classicalizing model there will be no plus one and if there is no plus one it, it it's immediate to show that the actual boundary in here is not two-thirds but it's one half and what is this boundary that stefano was mentioning this boundary is the boundary at which the spin wave approximation so there is the boundary at which there is no difference in studying the critical behavior of the spins or the critical behavior of the bosons and so it's the it's this is this of course also in nearest neighbor system no but probably this would be clear only for the people of you that are expert that know something about critical phenomena we know that the icing model the transition of the icing model becomes mean field when the dimension is larger than four and this is the case for the same case for the long range system the long range system becomes mean field where sigma is smaller than a certain value but this is nothing but what i told you before it's the effective dimension so you can just say when is the effective dimension d 2d over sigma becoming larger than four well the effective dimension to the over sigma is becoming larger than four when sigma is larger than than the half and this is the mean field threshold exactly as stefano has defined it to you mm -hmm. but this is valid for a thermal phase transition for a phase transition like the one of the bose gas that appears as a function of the temperature for a quantum phase transition that appears at t equals zero like the one of the spins then one has to do a little bit of a different calculation and this goes to be two thirds okay i think i said uh, whatever i wanted to say about this okay, okay so let's uh, finish here uh, so it's uh, quite late so thanks uh, nicolo you have the full day in front yeah okay so and uh, Let's meet uh, tomorrow at 4 p.m. for the last uh, talk. Okay? Ciao, ciao, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.